So I, I actually want to talk about how Alabama is going to defend Oklahoma and how Oklahoma is going to defend Alabama, at least in terms of what they're used to. So um, I, I'm going to show a picture right here that I tweeted out earlier in this week that it shows basically, <laughs> basically Texas Tech playing like a seven safety look and I'm doing this from memory by right now, but it was, it, I think it was no, there was, there was kind of a middle linebacker playing center field was probably uh shadowing um, Kyler Murray and, and everybody else in the secondary was playing at least eight yards off the ball. It was second and seven in the first quarter in the red zone. It was a six yard hitch or, or it was a quick, it was a quick like six yard completion that went for a touchdown it was they were so far off the ball it was actually a pick play the wide receiver was trying to pick to set up for the tight end who did catch the ball but they were so far back that they could not even set a good pick and they didn't have to talk about first let's do Alabama versus Oklahoma offense um you, you talked in the in the live show about how some things can be shocking for a team we said last year that Baker Mayfield in this Oklahoma offense was going to be shocking for Georgia to see that is there an opportunity or possibility here that not necessarily the Alabama defense is great, that there's some amazing defense or whatever? Because I do think they're really a defense. But let's talk about how maybe just the looks that they're going to show Kyler Murray and this Oklahoma offensive line and offense in that they're going to play press man a little bit. You're going to come out four wide. They're not going to drop. They're not going to drop eight. They're going to send four almost every time, even with a three down lineman look. Um, and it's not something that they see a lot of. Talk about that a little bit. And if you see there, that there's possibly an opportunity for Alabama to kind of shock them based on just showing them a look that they're not comfortable with inside the Big 12. Right. So I'm looking at the picture you have now. Um, there's five guys in the line of scrimmage, one linebacker, and then you've got five guys in a shell over the top. And just judging by the look, and I don't, I don't remember the, I don't know how the play went. It's hard to tell actually if this is man or zone. It's probably man, uh, a loose man coverage scheme. But they're all it's second and seven, and, and the closest defensive back to the ball is eight yards off the ball. So teams are doing that in large part because they're struggling to deal with Oklahoma's ability to get vertical. And they've got to give some cushion. They'd rather let Oklahoma catch the ball underneath. The theory here being that it's second and seven. You let them catch them underneath. You're almost in this prevent because you've got five guys across the line of scrimmage, 42-yard wide field, so every guy's got about eight yards to cover in terms of width. And you let them catch it in front of you, hopefully tackle them, make it a third and four, and then take your chances in an incompletion, you know, maybe an errant pass, which Murray does not do with, with, with much frequency. That ended up being a touchdown, Right. And the reason for it is you're not doing anything to disrupt the timing or operation of the play. If you let guys have clean releases, then the offense gets to move at their tempo and at their speed. And we talk about this a little bit in the SEC with some of the more potent offenses. Um, like Al Auburn's 2013 offense was very much this way. They had a lot of – their defense faltered quite a bit in that time period because they, in practice, tended not to have a lot of contact – and their whole practicing scheme was trying to remember how to do the play perfectly every time. If you don't jam receivers, if you don't have guys in the throwing lanes and you let them operate with timing, Lincoln Riley's offense, I think, is a little bit similar in operation in that their guys know how to execute that play against air to perfection. And if you let them do that, they will murder you. So you have to get in their way. The problem was teams, when they tried to do that, they would just get thrown over the top immediately because Murray had has an incredibly live arm and Oklahoma has really dynamic playmakers. They can't stay with you. Can't stay with them in man coverage, and they've got you really spread out. Like in this picture, it's a four wide. You got a four wide set with one back. And even if if you're man in this set, if you choose to go man, then you've got to be manned up on uh, across the board here. You know, one, two, three DBs at the bottom, one guy DB at the top, which means that DB kind of sitting on the hash has to drop into a single safety look. Um, and, and at that point, you've got six guys that you can maybe do a 4-2 coverage underneath. Most teams, including Texas Tech, couldn't get any pressure due to Oklahoma's offensive line in a 4-2 set. Uh, bringing four with a defensive lineman, they never get home. That's why they walk the fifth guy up. But that means you've got nothing 
within 10 yards, but that one guy sitting on the hash, what Alabama's going to do, they're going to be more than happy to bring four. Um, Alabama, again, and I, I'm, you know, you talk about shocking them. I, I don't think they're necessarily going to shock Oklahoma in some ways, but Quentin Williams, the defensive tackle for Oklahoma, for Alabama, he's a defensive tackle and nose guard that leads the team in solo tackles with 42. You don't see that. Uh, he's he, This year, for the most part, he's been an Ndamukong Sioux level disruptive force to where he by himself, probably will generate more pass rush in this game than Oklahoma has faced at any point this season. Um, and then outside them, you know, across the line, you know, Raekwon Davis was a lot of people that have projected at a first-round draft pick early in the year. Neither one of us have ever been quite as quite so high on him. Um, and he's still a junior. He may develop. Uh, but you got guys like Anthony Jennings, who had a uh, big play against Clemson in the playoff last year. Uh, Christian Miller, both those guys coming off injury and getting healthy late in the year. Uh, Isaiah Bugs, who is you know maybe actually in some ways has better, more disruptive stats. I think he has more sacks than Williams does. It, they're going to rely on four, and and it's probably going to be three down linemen, and you're going to have an outside Jack linebacker in a three-four scheme. They're going to take two linebackers and float them, and Dylan Moses and and uh, Mac Wilson, and then the trick there again back to the earlier discussion. How well do they know their assignments is going to be a big question. I think the long layoff will be huge for Alabama in that regard because their their defense is going to have time to study enough tape that they actually, you know, they're going to have their assignments a little better in theory. Now, Oklahoma may counter by throwing out new formations, but I think that's probably less likely actually. Um, and then in the back seven, uh, barring another injury, because Alabama has nothing left if they have any more defensive players injured, um, they have they already lost a starting corner in Trevon Diggs, and then they're back – what a lot of people, probably Oklahoma fans, don't know is they've lost most all their backup corners and safeties. Uh, but and those linebackers. St- and linebackers, yeah. They, they have Alabama has zero depth. They're, they're razor thin because they've been decimated with, by attrition, particularly at actually at the second string. Um, but Sertain at corner is probably, you know, already becoming, he's probably going to be the best corner on the field. Um, and is probably actually is a true freshman. There's probably a real argument Sertain may be the best corner that they've faced. Um, on the other side, I mean, you, and again, Savion Smith. I think Savion Smith, at one, I can't remember if he's a high four-star or five-star. No, he was a five-star Juco player, wasn't he? Um, so, so essentially you're facing two five-star corners when you've never – I don't think they've faced one at any point this season. Um, Deontay Thompson is easily one of the best safeties, if not the best, best uh, free safety in the country. Um, Xavier McKinney is one of the best strong safeties in the country. Really across the board at every position in the passing game, you're going to be facing the best athlete man for man. Alabama is not going to be afraid of Oklahoma in press man in terms of being burned over the top. I think the Marquise Brown, Hollywood Brown injury is huge in this game. And I don't know if he's going to be 100%. No one does. I, it, no one knows if he's going to even play. But if he does play, if he's even at 80% and can't blow, blow the top off, that's the one guy that I think would kind of scare Alabama that they maybe can't stay with because he's so dynamic. Um, without him, I don't think CD Lamb is athletic enough to really burn Alabama's secondary. Yeah, CD Lamb. You know, I'm glad you mentioned him. CD Lamb and Calcaterra are good wide receivers. They're, they're CD, good. CD Lamb is very good. Yeah, they're good wide receivers, but they're not Jalen Waddle on the other side in terms of taking the top off the defense. Um, they're not guys that that you really have to scheme for and keep an eye out. And we saw this, you said earlier, because we were talking about how Texas Tech and Iowa State were defending, when you and I were talking about going through watching these games, how they were defending Oklahoma. They were defending them in a way that looked ridiculous on film because they were so worried about Brown over the top. And by the way, against Iowa State, I think it was their first touchdown, It was a bomb to Brown over the top where safety was way back, still didn't recover in time, and it was just smoke on the DB. So I agree with you. That's a huge potential blow to them from a scheme and and strategy standpoint. And I think the equalizer to all this really is the quarterback play and the dynamics that they bring into it. And again, we're talking about a lot about Oklahoma. I mean, our channel tends to favor a little more. We cover more Southern games probably than we do games in other markets. So I think hopefully Alabama fans appreciate this discussion. The problem with press man with Oklahoma 
is it requires you to turn your back to Kyler Murray. And that is pretty terrifying. So I think all of this discussion leading up to this point is really based around the principle that teams are going to haven't been able to line up and play press man. Well, there's two things, two really two issues with that. One, we already got to the fact that they were scared of Oklahoma's receivers over the top. You made the point the Iowa State game. I think I remember that play. It's it ends up being in double coverage, but Brown just split Brown just basically runs by both of them. They have him theoretically bracketed, but they're not fast enough to keep the bracket. And it's an excellent throw by Kyler Murray over the top. But you know, if you do do that too, I think the second reason why you see that look like in second and seven is teams want to make darn sure that they keep an eye on Kyler Murray because in a lot of games, he had a six yard carry off the edge anytime he wanted it. Right. He is he, even in against Alabama too. He's probably going to be the fastest player in the field when he's out there. Um, I, I don't know. I think certain certain and Savion Smith, the corners for Alabama might give him a run for his money. But it's saying something when you say that two corners will give him a run for his money. Early on, Alabama struggled really badly with Kellen Mond from Texas A&M. It burned them by scrambling the ball. Um, and it was because Alabama's impressed man. They turned their backs to the quarterback, and Mond was faster than the linebackers. I think you kind of hit it, though. It's it's not you're, – you're, Alabama isn't as worried about the 85-yard run from Kyler Murray. The problem with how they're going to defend Oklahoma is – that eight-yard run might be there all day long. And the whole thing for Alabama is you stop them four times in this game, you win. You make them punt four times in this game, you win. And when you got a quarterback that can get six, seven yards whenever he wants on a little scamper, and he can, that makes it really tough to get them off the field. It, the first, So the first – of the series of Clemson Alabama games, the one where Alabama won, but Deshaun Watson put up an absolute show. He didn't rip off a ton of long runs in that game. He killed Alabama with his mobility by escaping the pocket and extending plays by making really accurate throws downfield, but by consistently being able to scramble for six right. to eight yards. It, it was opportunities where Alabama most of the time forces you into second and 10. All of a sudden they're f- facing second and four. Um, and that's, I think that's going to be the biggest issue of the game. Can Alabama contain Kyler Murray with four? They, I don't know that they'll traditionally spy them. They may, but I, it's also with the linebackers can contain them. If they can do that, they could have a lot of success defensively. If Murray can get outside the pocket, if they can't contain Murray, it completely changes the way Alabama has to play Oklahoma just to keep Murray contained. And that's when Oklahoma's offense could be more effective. All right, so on the flip side, real quick, and then we'll get into the numbers, how Oklahoma is going to try to defend Alabama. And we've talked in the past. So we said, we going to the playoffs last year, we were concerned with Jalen Hurts' ability to score a lot of points at quarterback. But we said the one defense that he would do well against, and he has done well against his entire career, is Oklahoma. You said on the show, on our live show. Teams like Oklahoma, but yeah. No, no, no. Going into going into the playoffs last year, you said if they drew Oklahoma, Jalen Hurts would have a game. Right. So yeah. so in this game, is it is it that scary for Alabama fans if Tua is in a hundred percent or if Tua, I know we saw him at practice, he was moving around pretty good. But if Jalen Hurts had to play this game. Do you still feel comfortable with the possibility of Alabama putting up 50? I I absolutely would. Uh, so to your point, and, and this is what I was trying to clarify, right? We weren't saying necessarily it was Oklahoma specifically, but defenses of Oklahoma's caliber. Jalen Hurts at quarterback at Alabama struggled in big games at the end of the year because he was playing top 10 defenses. Jalen, well, really until this season at times – uh, in, in previous years, he did not throw the ball well enough under pressure, and particularly if you could bring an outside blitz to be able to move the ball effectively against a top defense that could stop the run. If you are not good enough to stop the average Alabama play, they can torch you with Jalen Hurts because he does run zone read concepts and RPOs. He is an extremely gifted athlete. Alabama has extremely gifted athletes at wide out, and if you're not very good, if you're not assignment sound, and if you start getting strained by the run, especially if you start walking guys up into the box, you you can't, with a single safety look, cover Alabama's receivers reliably. 
uh, you know, Motley for Oklahoma has been a li- liability the entire year. And, and I was looking at this, the stats. It's kind of funny, right, that Motley at corner has 40 solo tackles. Kelly at linebacker has 27. Why is that? It's because teams see Motley as a massive liability and they target the crap out of that kid. You don't want him on an island with any of Alabama, you know, Henry Ruggs or Jerry Judy or anybody else in having, even with a Jalen Hurts, because if you're trying to stop Jalen Hurts and you're trying to deal with his run game, now your corners are going to be a position where he maybe has easy throws to a wide open guy down the field with a single read or, you know, to to a large extent, they're just going to run the ball with their stable of running backs because, um, you know, I mean, they're they're four deep with likely NFL caliber running backs as much as it's an overstated made statement. I mean, Damian Harris, probably one of the most underrated thousand yard back to back thousand yard rushers I've ever seen. Um, Josh Jacobs is coming on and looking like a future NFL starter. Um, Najee Harris was the top overall back who's running third string because of how good the guys in front of him are. And then Brian Robinson was just, you know, your average high four star running back. Um, that's sitting running four string and nobody knows who he is because of how good the other guys are. Yeah. And, and you know, you mentioned Molly Trey Norwood on the other side. He he's, he's an okay cornerback. He he's an okay corner who looks bad in big 12 play. Cause he faces good quarter quarterbacks. He's the guy that lines up over David Sills at West Virginia or, or the best wide receiver. Um, he's not great. So that, Again, brings me back to let's discuss this last point before we get into the numbers. That brings me back to this concern. If I'm an Oklahoma fan, let's let's discuss this like two is healthy and he's going to play. Um, how does Oklahoma? Because somebody said in the live show they asked us. They said, "Does Oklahoma's defense step up like Georgia's defense de- did? Does everybody remember when Alabama played Oklahoma in twenty in 2013?" Oklahoma had the 24th ranked defense that year. They played good defense. Georgia has a top 10 defense this year, top 15 defense this year. They play good defense. It's hard to explain how bad, and I'm not killing Oklahoma. These are facts. It's hard to explain how bad this Oklahoma defense is. So if you're them, or based on what you think they might do, how do you approach this Alabama offense to give her your own offense a puncher's chance? I think the biggest thing you do when you're trying to face Alabama, if you're Oklahoma in this game, is you have to be very aggressive. Alabama has not always dealt with blitz as well. I think you do have to step back a little bit from the health of Tua. If if Tua was completely healthy in this game, quite honestly, if he was the guy he was at the start of the year where it seemed like he couldn't miss a pass, I, I would think Alabama would score over 60 points in this game. And it, I would... I would have a uh, be very having a very strong debate on whether or not they were going to score seventy. With him being limited in his mobility, I think Oklahoma can try to run overload blitzes. And essentially, what you're doing is you're gambling that Tua may dump the ball off, and you're just going to give up a touchdown on that play. But if he doesn't make the right read, you might get a sack. Um, you get some hits on the quarterback, and maybe you can create negative plays and get a stop. And that's the kind of thing where you may do that four drives in a row, and on three of them you give up an easy touchdown, but on the fourth one you get a negative play and you get a stop. Because if you're Oklahoma in this game, you pretty much need to assume Alabama's going to score 40 points. Your hope is you keep it to somewhere not that much higher than 40. You don't want it to get to 50, and if it gets to 60, you're going to lose. The only way to do that is you basically are going to want to get you want three or four stops in this game, really. You want about four stops in the entire game. You be extremely aggressive with that. You do all. You move guys around in coverage as much as possible to try to generate an interception when they're looking the wrong way. And you know by doing this, you're going to give up a ton of explosive plays. You're going to allow the run game to work because, and I think this is the other side of it. The efficiency offense, the efficiency defense for Oklahoma is the thing that's so atrociously bad. The fear, if you're Oklahoma, really isn't the deep ball from Alabama, in my opinion. The fear, if you're Oklahoma, is that Alabama runs the ball for eight yards per carry and that Tua throws four incompletions in the game. Where Alabama has eight yard, eight play scoring drive after eight play scoring drive the entire game, maybe never sees a third down where they're running, they're getting nine yards per play, but they're not doing it in chunks, they're just doing it very consistently. Because that's going to wear out your defense 
it's going to be demoralizing and your offense isn't going to be able to keep rhythm the way you'd like. Um, and if you let them have explosive plays where you're overly aggressive, as much as that's going to give up a lot of points, I think your offense is used to that pressure. I think you have a defense that's used to giving up enough points. As weird as it is, it's a positive. They're not going to freak out if they give up 50 points in a game. That's an advantage Oklahoma has, maybe over Alabama. And you know, when you're that aggressive too and you're giving up a lot of explosive plays, but maybe you get occasional stops, it's going to help you in time of possession because – Alabama's not going to not going to run eight plays every drive. Um, you know they're going to run three or four, and they're you know let's say they run six. They're either going to score in six or they're going to get stopped in six. That's what you want. You don't want this dragging out to eight to twelve plays. You don't want the defense getting worn down to where the end of the game. What happened last year against Georgia, right? Where Georgia just ran the ball pretty much every play, and they got twenty yards of carry because the defense that wasn't very good to start with, they got exhausted by the end of that game and they couldn't even stay on the field. And once that happened, it became almost impossible, even with Baker Mayfield for Georgia to win that game, even in overtime. That's what you don't want to happen with Alabama. You want to be aggressive and give up points and hope you can keep pace with your own offense. Because if you let yourself get cut, you know, take the death by a thousand cuts. And again, looking back at the statistics and talking about 126 out of 130 in passing efficiency allowed, if you let Alabama just be efficient that's where they have an edge on you, and that's going to let them dominate time of possession. It's going to let your defense get exhausted, and that will cause you to lose the game. All right. Well, let's see what the computer model says. Let us know what uh, what the numbers look like, and we'll go from there. Um, we run this model. Uh, you know, we have a whole video explaining it. If you want to get super geeky for like twenty or thirty minutes and have a math class, feel free to do so. Uh, and we try to break it down in murderous detail. But the short version is we look at per play stats, not total yardage stats. We do that because tempo for different teams is too different. Some teams, total, y- total yardage is a definitely a function of the number of plays run. Um, and that however many plays your team runs, it's going to kind of average out. If you have a high tempo, if you're Oklahoma and you run high tempo, you're also going to give Alabama more plays. So you don't want to factor tempo into your calculation Um, We look at it relationally versus the teams you play, how they did against everybody else versus how they did against you, generate some intermediate statistics, generate an estimate of how your offense is going to do in this game. And then based on that, what our model does is it creates a scoring model for your team unique to how you've done this year. So if your team has generated, you know, generated some points of non-offensive touchdowns and scored at a really high clip off yardage, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to give you a high estimate for scoring for low yardage. Um, and then you have some teams like LSU quite frequently, their pro style offense, they can have a lot of yardage and often can, will outgain teams and score less because their style of offense just doesn't score very many points. Um, they're not very explosive. So this is designed to be a baseline model. So we have a neutral talking point. We don't adjust it game per game. And whatever this says here, we can kind of use, again, just like S&P, to rationalize whether or not our opinions are actually objective. The first thing we do, we look at generate is a an intermediate stat of percentage of opponent averages allowed. So what that means is if your opponents, on average, if all your opponents average five yards per carry, you allow four, you allow 80% of their averages. It's a lot easier to hold teams below their averages against the run than the pass. Most teams get their passing average, for the most part, against anybody they play. And you can hold teams to less, but it, it, we almost never see that number drop below about 75%. There's a reason why having an elite quarterback, especially when you get really high level like the NFL, is so important. And that's because a really good quarterback, for the most part, is going to get his yards. And you can only kind of sort of keep him from doing that. Alabama allows teams to have 69% of their opponent, their rushing average, and 79% of their passing average. Um, Those are both elite numbers. Anything I would say below 80% against the pass is elite. Anything below 70% against the rush is elite. Those are not the best numbers we've ever seen from them. Uh, The past few years, they've often dipped in the 50s in the rush numbers. I think Clemson right now, off the top of my head, uh, is in the 50s. Indeed, they're at 55% against the run. Um, But very quietly, what Alabama has done is their passing defense is really, really good statistically. Uh, Notre Dame at 75% is probably the next best one. You know, Michigan, uh, Michigan's on up there too. But Alabama's pass defense is very, very good. Um, it's really just that 70% against the run, which is in still kind of an elite number, is not the number one rush defense that they normally are. Um, Oklahoma, on the other hand, 98% of opponent rushing and 105% of opponent passing averages. 
I think a lot of people would have expected Oklahoma to have horrifically bad numbers. The fact is they give people, they allow people to have right about their average. There's two points here to have to be made. The first thing is one, I set the bar for average at 95%. And the reason for that is you play some out of conference weak teams that always inflate your stats. For the example, of Oklahoma, it's Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic averages are built based off playing in their conference. You should beat up on a team like that. That always inflates your numbers a little bit. So I say 95% is the neutral mark and anything above that is bad. The second caveat to this entire discussion, and there's really no way to no way to really neutralize this point. We are comparing how Alabama did against SEC teams and how Oklahoma did against Big 12 teams. So when you look at that 69%, 79%, Alabama allows teams 69% of their rush average is basically compared to other SEC teams. So if you want to think of, and it's before anybody jumps up and says, well, SEC teams don't run the ball that well. Well, if they don't run the ball that well, their average is lower. So it's harder to have a good number. The better way to look at it is if the average SEC defense allows 100%, Alabama allows 70. And the if the average SEC defense allows 100%, they allow 80%. So they're that much better than the average SEC defense. The problem for Oklahoma is... 98% and 105%, they're exactly like the average Big 12 defense. But for the reasons I sp- talked about earlier, actually, they're really below average because the average Big 12 defense is going to be a 95% or better. Um, so Oklahoma is a below average defense relative to the rest of the Big 12. Alabama is a very good defense relative to the rest of the SEC. Um, and then moving on to reduction numbers, how does that all sort of shake out based off the averages? Our model guess is that Alabama is going to average over five yards per carry and almost 12 yards per pass attempt, 11.65 yards per attempt. Oklahoma is projected to have about 4.6 yards per carry and nine yards per attempt. Those are both very, very good numbers. Uh, the way that tracks at the end of the day is that Alabama averages 8.3 yards per play. Oklahoma allows six, or will average 6.7. That number for Oklahoma should be the lowest number of the year. Um, that is is very realistic. Alabama is statistically far better than any defense they've played. They really should, in a neutral, you know, one-off average of a thousand games perspective, they should be predicted to have their lowest offensive output of the year. That said, 6.7 yards per play is not that far below what they allowed, what they got against Texas in their championship game, 6.8, excuse me, 6.86 yards per play. Unsurprisingly, the model, the model saying that at 6.8, seven, five yard per player. So they're still going to be very effective. So it predicts Oklahoma will have 41 points in the game. The problem is at 8.3 yards per play, that is Alabama doing anything they want to do. Um, Alabama has the closest game for that for Alabama was the Auburn game. And they put up 52 points uh, in, in recent weeks. And then if you want to go back from there, you have to, again, you have to go all the way back to Arkansas that, and from that was the time period when they were averaging 60 plus. The biggest thing that changed for Alabama in that time period is they played better defenses. LSU, Mississippi State, and Georgia are all top 15 defenses. Um, And the model thinks this game is going to resemble more of the start of the year. So again, even though Oklahoma is projected to score 41, Alabama is projected to score 49. So the model has this game, Alabama 49, Oklahoma 41. And that that's less than Vegas. Um, I, I think our model has a, a hard time sometimes when one unit is really bad. And in this case, um, you know, obviously Oklahoma's defense is really bad. So it's, it, it's struggling a little bit for what to do with that and what Alabama's normal game is going to look like. I also think that Alabama's games against teams like LSU and Mississippi State sort of skew their offensive numbers a little bit where they shut the game down pretty early. And if Alabama needs to, so this is where I, I kind of deviate from the, from the model, the 49 it's giving Alabama sort of ingests the season where if Alabama scored 49 points in a game, the other team had like 10. So that was pretty normal and they'd shut it down and Jalen Hurts would come in. If Oklahoma scores in the forties, Alabama would have if they if they played a team earlier in the year that was scoring close to 40 Alabama would have left their starters in the whole game and they would have been closer to to 60 um I, I'm gonna go ahead and give my score on this game um I for me 
I've said all along, I think this Oklahoma offense is legit. And I think for all the Alabama fans hoping that the Alabama defense shows up and Tua's game shows up and proves that Kyle Murray didn't deserve the Heisman, I don't I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and I don't think that's fair because Kyle Murray ain't playing, you know, Oklahoma's defense in this game. Um, the thing that scares me, if I'm an Oklahoma fan in this game, Alabama's scoring on par with Oklahoma this year, and they've played five top 50 offenses in, in both, if you look at scoring, or five top 50 defenses in both scoring, just straight up scoring defenses, and S&P uh, defensive efficiency. Oklahoma's played one. And I just don't think that Oklahoma is prepared to play a game where they might not be able to, where they might have to punt. Um, I think Oklahoma scores. I think they score pretty well, more than Alabama fans are comfortable with. I'm going to go 52 to 31 in this one. And that's assuming a, a healthy Tua. Um, I think one of the problems, so yes, Alabama could score 70 against a defense this bad, but generally a defense this bad is paired with an offense that can't score. So Alabama's getting the ball more. Alabama's getting short fields more. Alabama's scoring on defense more, which is what we saw against uh, Ole Miss. They're not going to get that as much against Oklahoma. Oklahoma's going to have drives and score. Now they might score fast, which also gives the opportunity for Alabama to score more, but I think... It's just so unprecedented to have the number one offense and the number 100 defense that we don't really know what to make of it. So since we don't know what to make of it, I'm going to go 52 to 31 and put my Alabama streak in jeopardy. I think I'm 9-0 and against the spread this year in Alabama games. It's something like that. Um, but we'll see. What do you think? So I do generally agree with you. Um, the point I would make with a model – the model, our model actually does a pretty good job of the boundary of dealing with situations where a team is playing a defense that's a lot better than anybody they played or, you know, an offense that's a lot better, et cetera, et cetera. It predicts a lot of blowouts. The issue here, I think, is twofold. One, Alabama, to your point, is projected to have yardage so close to the sort of yardage they had against, um, you know, basically games like Texas A&M, um, you know, kind of yards they had against better yardage than they had against Ole Miss, similar yardage to Ar- to the Arkansas State game. The model doesn't quite know what to do with it because in those games, Alabama sort of shut the things down and didn't try to score more than in the 50s. And the model kind of, the way it operates, it's kind of predicting, it's predicting them to do the same thing they did in the past with that kind of yardage and offensive output. I don't think Alabama does that though. They're not going to shut it down in this game. Uh, the flip side we haven't seen Oklahoma strained and it's pretty rare for our model to have no meaningful input at all. The Iowa state game was game three. Iowa state starting quarterback was injured in that game. Iowa state was pretty dysfunctional. They got, they got down and everything kind of fell apart on them. And that was the only really top 50 defense they faced. So drawing any conclusions from the data is almost impossible. I do think Oklahoma is going to score a lot of points. I don't think the 41 number is really unrealistic, and I'm going to go with that for Oklahoma. The problem is I think Alabama scores a lot more than predicted. I have this game, Alabama 60, Oklahoma 41. Um, That's only five points off from the spread, I think. So it's not super crazy. I just, looking at their games early this year, knowing that they compare, again, if if you want to take the average of the two games, two teams, Right above and below Oklahoma defensively in the SEC, it's Arkansas and Tennessee, 65 points, 58 points. You you take the average of that, it's about 61. Um, So I think it's realistic to think Alabama scores 60 points in this game. Yeah, and you've said before, and it had been proven correct, the thing that we see with Alabama is if they know they're facing a team who can score a lot of points, they don't take their foot off the gas for fear of getting just outscored. So where we saw them score 48 against a much better Texas A&M defense. And I say that, you know, Texas A&M secondary is really poor. Um, they're, they're, they're bad. They're on the level that we see with Oklahoma. Um, but they have an elite run defense, which schematically messes you up a little bit. They had 48 and three quarters. 
So 60 points isn't ridiculous. They had 48 points against a decent defense in three quarters of, of play and knew they didn't need any more. In a game where they know they need more, they're going to approach it a little bit differently. The one question I have for you is, you think Oklahoma's going to get 41, and I don't think that's crazy. Is there going to be enough physical time in this game for 101 points? So there should be. In general, average college football game, and I don't know the exact number right now, but it usually shakes out to where you get about, used to be 10 to 12 possessions. That number has gone higher. It's closer to 12. So if you were to score every time you touch the ball in a game, more or less you can score about 84 points. Uh, tempo could be a factor here. If both teams play aggressively, like especially if Oklahoma is as aggressive defensively as I think they may be, that's going to drive up the number of possessions because Alabama is going to score either score or go three and out you know, really quickly. That's what Oklahoma is probably going to try to do in this game. That means Alabama is going to get more possessions. There's going to be more clock. That may p- push higher. It's possible this number, you talk about if there's enough time for 100 points in this game. I think there's enough time probably for 150 points in this game. Uh, I don't think it gets to that number because I do think Alabama will get some stops. Just like everybody gets stops, everybody stops themselves. You know, West Virginia got stopped in that game. Oklahoma got stopped in that game some. I, I, I Yeah, I absolutely think there's enough time for 100 points. It's It's not... It is not outside the realm of possibility that both these teams could score 60 points in this game in regulation. It is not outside the realm of possibility. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think you can score that reliably on Alabama. Um, you can't score that reliably on any defense at beyond a certain level. So uh, so I do think 100 points is, is quite possible. It's so unfamiliar for Alabama fans or for anybody really to predict you know, 41 points in a loss and predict 60 points like that West Virginia 59 56 game went crazy but nobody predicted that nobody nobody predicted that high of a number so if Tua is healthy I don't think you're crazy I just think that you know what we talked about before was a lot of Kyler Murray being able to keep them on the field um six seven yard runs converting a lot of third downs, kind of like Deshaun Watson did in that first game, like you said. And for me, that means clock. And I think, I don't think they're going to try to shorten the game like a Georgia did or a Mississippi State did two years ago. I do think that they're not going to go tempo the entire game. I think if they score early, they're going to try to shorten the game a little bit um, because I think they'll have a good feel for you know, be you know, being able to ha- have some success against Alabama defense and put that pressure on the Alabama offense. My concern is one: Will Alabama get Brown back uh, on the offensive line? Will Tua be a hundred percent? If Tua can't run, that's a big part of his game as well. So, um, but like you said, I think I think Jalen could score, uh, put up a number as well. So. Um, give me your last thoughts on this game as we r- wind down this marathon discussion. I think the first thing I would say is if Tua was completely healthy, I would have a lot more confidence that Alabama would win the game. Alabama struggles at times in recent years when they're in a situation where they need to score every possession. It's like they're not used to that pressure and they're not very good at it. Alabama this year was almost a completely different animal, especially the first six weeks of the season, where they were completely comfortable scoring every time they had the ball. Their third down conversion rate was really good. If Jalen has to start for any reason, one, he did he's shown tremendous improvement in his limited time. And the SEC championship was not an aberration. It wasn't a surprise to those of us that watched them because they he, they rotated him in at times. But he will miss some throws, makeable throws. He'll miss a third and two pass that should get him a third down conversion where Tua almost never did when completely healthy. Um, so that, that gives Oklahoma a little bit of a chance uh, in the game. But I will say, by the way, if, even if Tua is very healthy and playing, I guarantee you, you will see both Jalen and Tua in the game at the same time. It was something Alabama was clearly working in mid season before Jalen sprained his ankle and they basically pulled it because they were they were looking to use Jalen as a running back and a receiver, and they didn't want him to get hit when they had two banged up quarterbacks. Um, the last thing I'll note, and it's it's a statistic that we kind of tracked, which we thought was kind of interesting, 
And that's how each one of these two Heisman t- contender quarterbacks, Tua and Murray, have done when they've faced other opponents and how, how their other opponents have failed, like it fared against other teams. So the interesting that, that stat... Yeah. So one of the interesting stats that we found is how Tua and Murray have done against their opponents in that was the game you got from Tua or Murray, was that the best game they'd seen? How many of Tua's games were the highest QB rating allowed by their opponents? How many of Kyler Murray's games were the highest QB rating allowed by their opponents? For Tua, 8 of 13 games, he had the highest QB rating of any team, any quarterback against that team. That's pretty phenomenal. Kyler Murray, it was 6 of 13. That's also really phenomenal. It's unsurprising to me that Kyler Murray won the Heisman because both of these two guys, I mean, they're first and third all time in QB rating. Um, the Historically, they're on, I think they're first and third, maybe first and, I, I can't remember which one it is. Yard per attempt and QB rating, they're first and third in one and first and second historically in the other. Um, if, if, if they weren't in the same year, they easily win the Heisman any other year. Um, but, What's interesting to me with Murray is the majority of Oklahoma's opponents have actually given up a higher QB rating in some other game than they did to Oklahoma, which is very telling. Alabama's opponents generally have not had that problem. It's been a singular deal with Alabama. Most of them had their worst day against Alabama. Again, uh, about 75% of them. So that's kind of my last statistic. That's just kind of an interesting point. Um, and, And it's maybe my one red flag if you want to evaluate the Big 12 versus Alabama, if there's one way this could go sideways, it's there are some signs that as much as Murray dominated the teams they played, most of those teams had a worse day in terms of pass defense against somebody else. It is possible that the Big 12 has overinflated those numbers. However, you know, my parting shot with this is I don't think that's necessarily true. I think it's just as likely, in fact, maybe probable that the Big 12 has quietly been one of the better conferences um, at least at the top, um, I, I, it's been a rough year for everybody but the SEC. I think the SEC is just that strong this year, um, and and that's why I have a lot more confidence to, for Alabama to win the game. You, you stole one of my parting shot points with Jalen because I was going to say as well that he's going to play in this game and not when it's not in the thought that it's going to get out of hand. He's going to play in this game in meaningful minutes. Um, my kind of parting shot is to both fan bases that have hung on this long with us. Alabama fans, if you want to do your homework on Oklahoma, watch the West Virginia game and the Texas game in the uh, the, champ- the Texas championship game. Um, Texas has a good, not great defense, borderline. They're, they're like 55th. They're not terrible. Um, West Virginia's defense is terrible. But – you get to see some things in terms of there's contrasting styles there defensively that Oklahoma faced and offensively because Texas is not a great offensive team. Ellinger is, he missed two throws on their opening drive that they they ended up scoring a touchdown anyway, but on back-to-back throws, there was a guy open by like 10 yards that he overthrew him. They still scored a touchdown. Anyway, watch those games. Oklahoma fans, if you want to kind of get a good feel for this Alabama team and what they can do, watch the Missouri game because that is a good offense that can run the ball and pass the ball. Um, And then watch the Auburn game. The Auburn game is the first game in a since really before the LSU game. So the first game in like five or six weeks that Tua was actually healthy. And they put up 52. This is back to where we're saying it's not crazy that they put up all these points that we're pick- predicting. They put up 52 uh, on this 16 or 18th best defense in the country. Um, so that would be your homework. This one was really long, y'all. We're probably going to make it two parts. Uh, it was over an hour of discussion, but this is a really important one. And because there's such contrasting styles and so many other underlying stories, we really wanted to get into it. Oklahoma fans, I hope you see by now that we're pretty objective about your team, even though we 
cover mostly uh, Southern games and then any big game outside of the, the SEC. Uh, Alabama fans probably hate us because we didn't pick them to win 100 nothing, but that's what you get when we're when we're honest. So uh, please remember to subscribe if you haven't. We're going to do uh, coverage throughout the playoffs, throughout this you know month long kind of hangover. And uh, y'all, thanks so much. Have a great week and God bless. Thank you.